On today's show, we will be talking about the secrets to long-term love relationship happiness. This podcast has been developed with the intent to inform and educate the general public and providers and should not be relied upon for any other purpose. The content, views, and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speaker and not those of the San Diego Psychological Association. Welcome to the San Diego Psychological Association's podcast, Diving Into Healing. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Carcel. We're excited to be talking about the topic of the secrets to long-term love relationship happiness. I'd like to welcome our guests and relationship experts, Dr. Stephen Solomon and Dr. Lori Tiagno. Thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Before we begin, tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you became interested in couples work in long-term relationships. Go ahead, Laura. Thanks, Stevie. Um, Well, I started about 40 years ago working with kids. And whenever you work with kids, you inevitably work with the family to kind of figure out what's going on. And when you work with the family, you begin to see that a lot's going on in the marriage. So I eventually started working with marriages because that's the center of the family. And in working with marriages over many, many years, and Steve and I collaborating for about 30 years, uh, we both started to notice the number of infidelities um, and marital problems that came into our offices. And so we decided um, through experience and the clients that came in to really focus on marriages because that's the heart of the family. Um, and you start out with a, as a couple and then you, if you have kids, then you launch them and then you come back as a couple. So we wanted to really hold that part of um, our culture, our civilization together and figure out what we could do to help couples. So that was it for me. What about you, Stevie? Yeah, about the same. The only thing I would add, Lori, is that uh, over, over time, I grew increasingly frustrated with hearing uh, negative stories from my clients about what had happened and what kind of help they did or didn't get in couples therapy and uh, realized there's really not a lot of excellent training in couples therapy. And it's so important, as Lori was saying, uh, the, the basic unit of our society. And if couples don't have a strong relationship, it really not only negatively affects them, but their children as well. So. Uh, we got some advanced training and really focused on it. And we try and do as much training as we can, uh, or like in, in this case, Michelle, doing interviews because we want to share the knowledge that our couple clients have taught us about what makes long-term love relationships thrive and what causes them to break down. Yes, and and you both have been doing this for decades, if I'm not mistaken. It's been about 40 years that you've been interested in this field. Yes, and working together 39 years. Uh, Is it 39 or 40, Steve? Uh, 39. Yeah, since 82. Wow. So we would define you two as long-term co-working relationship here, right? Co-working relationship. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) Lori's one of my best friends. I love her. It's not a romantic love relationship, but so fortunate to have a partner that I can work with that I really love and respect so much. And we practice with each other what we help our couples with, because what the the skills you need in a long-term love relationship, whether it's romantic or otherwise, are the same across the board. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're the same skills that parents should also use with their kids. So we talk about that a lot. You know, the only difference with a long-term love relationship is that sexual component, Mm -hmm. which makes that so unique. But these skills you can use in any and every relationship. That's a great point. And I think, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I was thinking we could start with maybe having a little bit of a definition of a long-term love relationship. Uh, As far as time-wise, you know, to some, it might be one year is considered long-term and for others, it could be 10 years plus. What do you both define as a long-term love relationship? Well, Michelle, I don't really think of defining it in terms of a time frame as much as 
the partner's aspirations for the relationship. So we talk about long-term love relationships in terms of two people who are in love and committed to that relationship exclusively and both have the intention of having it last. Okay. Would you agree with that definition, Lori? I think that's a great definition, Steve. We've never been asked that question before, so that's terrific. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's good to to define it in, in whatever way makes sense for the relationship. And um, I was reading actually recently a research study that was conducted out of Stanford, and it's a longitudinal study that began in 2009, and it's actually still going. It's measuring, it's got about 3,000 plus um, same-sex and straight couples in the study, which I think is great for some diversity, as well as a diverse population. And what I thought was really interesting and how they're defining the long-term success of relationships was quantitatively in time. And what was interesting was the mark that was pretty specified in how people stayed together was around five years plus that within this study, they were seeing, you know, folks who were breaking up was more frequently in the first stages of the relationship. And a lot of that makes sense, right? Compatibility, dating, kind of seeing what's working. And then at that five year mark, they saw a, a drastic decline in people actually separating Marriage is holding the strongest, and that makes sense too. It being a, a you know basically a binding agreement when we get married. Um, so people, the longer you stay together, the more you want to work on it. And uh, I thought that was pretty neat, you know. So it just kind of seeing that. Uh, absolutely, but at the same time, that can be tricky. One of the things that Lori and I find is, oh yes, there's relationships that last decades. Oh yeah. But they're not happy relationships. Correct. The people stay in because they're afraid of the alternative uh, or for whatever reason. So it's not just the length of time. What we're really focused on is helping people really feel happily, whether it's married or happily uh, committed to the relationship and feeling fulfilled and the relationship is growing. Unfortunately, Many people stay together for a long, long time, and they're not really happy. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And and that um, study talks about that, where a lot of times it's more, oh, well, I, I've already put in the time. And there's a fear of loss. There's a fear of of moving forward. And there's there's so many factors uh, when it comes to long-term love relationship that you're, you're hitting the, the nail right on the head. It doesn't matter how long we've actually been together. It matters on how successful we're making the relationship work. So I think that leads me to another question. What dooms long-term love relationships? What do you find that are like the, the pieces that are not working in these relationships? Can I start that one, Stevie? Go ahead, Laura. Um, and what I just did is one of the things we teach couples is we we collaborate to ask, is it okay if I take that one? That's one of the relationship skills. <laughs> I'm just going to point them out as we do it, of mutual respect and giving each other the benefit of the doubt and checking in. Too often people just blurt things out and they don't have a dance, a cadence to the relationship. But what dooms relationships? We talk about what we call the three intimacies. That's our unique contribution. Self-intimacy, which is the ability to know what you feel, think, and want, but mostly feel. Because we talk about if you don't know what you're feeling, you know, you're just going to be helter-skelter and reactive rather than responding to another person. So you want to know what you're feeling because we also say that every action is dictated or motivated by a feeling. You know, if I kick somebody in the shins, I'm probably angry at them. If I give them a hug, I probably feel affectionate. But too often we don't realize what we're feeling and we just react. So we talk about self-intimacy and then we come to the big one, which is conflict intimacy. When Steve and I went to graduate school, I was in the Washington DC area. You know, there was Bowen and, and uh, Haley and uh, Mnuchin. Mm -hmm. But what was going on then was it was really focused on families, not couples. There was very little in the way of couples therapy. Mm -hmm. And so when we went to graduate school, we were taught date night and compromise. 
That was about it. And keep your sex life alive. Well, all of us who've been married know if you don't like each other, you're not going to want to have sex. You don't want to go out on a date. And the last thing you want to do is compromise. So we developed conflict intimacy, which is the ability to get through your inevitable differences um, constructively. And that is the heart of the majority of the work that we do with people. So what dooms couples is the inability to A, recognize tension and differences are normal and not a threat to the relationship, mm -hmm. and B, that that's where their growth is going to happen, by getting through the differences. So we teach them ways to be conflict intimate. So couples are doomed when they avoid their conflict. And a last thing I want to add is um, there was a piece of research many, many years ago that took uh, couples who were self-described as happily married. They asked the couples about how they dealt with conflict and differences. And the, the couples naturally uh, separated into two groups. One, that they did not maintain their expectations in the relationship over time. And the second group maintained their expectations. Mm -hmm. So I'll often ask the couples I work with, which couple over five years, 10 years, do you think was happiest? A lot of people will say, well, the ones who lowered their expectations. And I say, no, the ones who lowered their expectations ended up with a disappointing marriage, inability to get through conflict. The ones who held up their expectations, learned how to get through their conflict and never gave up on their expectations. They learned to negotiate. And so that's what conflict intimacy is. You want to talk about that, Stevie, and add? Well, the, you know, the last intimacy is what normal normally we think of when we think about intimacy, and that's affection intimacy. So those are the three intimacies that govern the health of a long-term love relationship. But, you know, one of the most amazing things for Lori and I, Michelle, in doing this work is that we really found there are very few things that really doom a long-term love relationship. Very few things that couples cannot recover from. I mean, Lori and I have worked with couples where domestic violence, drug abuse and addiction. Multiple affairs. Right. Uh, the things that, you know, most of us would think, man, how are they ever going to survive that? And we've seen that couples have taught us they actually not only can survive terrible traumas and crises like those, but they can remake their relationship, build a stronger foundation and be more fulfilled and happier over the long term. So we've really only found three things that actually doom a long-term love relationship and keeping in mind the three intimacies that Lori was talking about. Mm -hmm. The first one and the least frequent is that one or both partners initially never fell in love with the other one. You know, we really need that love and the, the wonderful, magical experience of falling in love for most of us to be able to hold the relationship together for when the going really does get tough, when it would be really easy to chuck it and see the grass is greener on the other side. Mm -hmm. So that's the first deal breaker, as we call it. The second one, and more common, ha is uh, dealing with conflict intimacy that Lori was just talking about. It's over a significant period of time, Michelle, we find at least eight or 10 years one of two bad things has happened in terms of how the couples deal with their differences and conflicts. Either mm -hmm. they have the conflict style of brushing everything under the rug. Yes. You know, what we call conflict avoidance. They don't talk about their issues, their differences, their conflicts, their hurt feelings, their anger. They brush it all under the rug. And what happens over a long period of time is without the intimacy of dealing with what we call the, the dark side of the passion in the relationship, the dark, passionate, negative feelings, that it yeah. kind of starves to death the love that one or both of them had for the other, and the love is gone. And once the love is gone, you, it's not something you can just switch on and off. It takes a long time to really 
kill or or st- in this case starve that love to death you know as we say eight or ten years but it can happen so either couples are conflict avoidant and the love gets starved to death or they have knocked down drag out fights that not only rarely resolve the problem that they're fighting about but the way that they fight just is adding insult to injury hurting adding more hurt more negative feelings And over time, so much hurt and anger and resentment can uh, be built up that it kills the love that one or both partners had. So that's the second deal breaker. But by far the most common deal breaker that we find, the third deal breaker, is that one or both partners refuse to take responsibility for their part in the problems in the relationship and sincerely try their hardest to become a better partner, to strengthen, to turn weaknesses into strengths, to own their own bad habits, their own mistakes, whatever, and really work as hard as they can to become a better person and a better partner. So those are the really the only things that we found that if one of those is triggered or is it exists in the relationship, that couples therapy really won't be able to help the couple be able be able to overcome those. Nothing in our experience, nothing will. Right, and I'm thinking back in examples, um, even in my own practice and things that I've seen. And at first, let me reflect on what you were saying about clinicians and training in couples work. I could not agree with you more. Um, I don't recall having any coursework in couples work specifically in graduate school. Yeah, me either. Um, most of my stuff was postdoctoral when I was already licensed. You know, this this is when I I found the Gottmans. I I found you know Sue Hendricks. I found um, uh, I'm sorry, um, Dr. Hendricks. I found um, uh, Sue Johnson. These these are people that you know had their own research and had to kind of go on their own, much like the two of you to give these examples. And and I'm so happy to hear how you've described it because as you were speaking, I was thinking of, oh yeah, that I've seen that and kind of even experiencing some of that in my, you know, own relationship and how we work it through is what really matters. And something that came up for me, and I'm curious what both of you think is, is reparation and resilience. When you were talking about skills, I find personally that People who are resilient in the relationship, able to really see and view and stick with it. And like you said, Lori, I like the way you said the expectations, you know, sticking with staying true to the the goals of the relationship, so to speak, um, that that actually can help people. But they have to have the skills and they have to know how to repair because we're bringing in all of our own trauma into the relationship. And I'm sure the two of you see a lot of that as well, like individual trauma really affecting the entire relationship. So I, I like the way both of you said this. I think it really helps kind of simplify this. And and I, I, I'm curious more on the skills piece. What skills do partners need in order to be a good partner based on what we're talking about? Before we get to skills, can I, I want to comment on something you just said. Of course. So one of the things we see before we get to skills is We both do a lot of educating of our couples. We want to normalize this because, you know, one of the things Steve and I talk about is writing a book on how do you make a relationship? Because it's something we co-create. People think, you know, you fall in love, love is enough, love will keep you together, you'll figure it out. I'm sorry, love is not enough. And we are co-creating this relationship. We tell our clients of many things. Within the first two to three years, all your unfinished business from your family of origin is going to show up. We don't use the word trauma because you know in the field there's the capital T trauma, the small T trauma. I don't want to make people feel like, oh my God, you know, it's it's all this trauma stuff. My parents did it. We just talk about you bring all your unfinished business. Everyone has unfinished business. Parents' job is not to complete and tie us up in a bow and send us off. That's not life. We continue to evolve. But we say you're going to trip over the unfinished anger you had at your brother or not feeling good enough in your mother's eyes. 
So we tell them, that's what's coming up here. Isn't that lovely that you're in a relationship where the normal stuff is showing up, that you've stopped putting on, you know, your best, your best face and, you know, showing up masked. Now you get to roll up your sleeves and do your individual work in the presence of another, which is the privilege of a long-term love relationship. It's, you know, doing something and having someone observe it and assist you. And when we can show our underbelly to someone else and that someone else stands there empathetically and with compassion, that is a form of love in action. And we talk about these things. So the resilience we teach, the healing we teach, and most people do it. Now, one of the other things I say to couples all the time is, listen, if you did with your spouse what you do with your children, which is give them the benefit of the doubt, work through problems to resolution, you know, don't do power plays, Steve and I would be out of a job. Because the best of parenting is so much of what the best of coupling is. But we have to show them the different form it takes in an adult relationship. Go ahead, Steve. And I'm, I'm really glad you, you brought that up, Michelle, because one of, if not the most common mistakes that we find new or poorly trained couples therapists make is they focus solely on the relationship between the two partners. And what Lori and I always say when we're training couples therapists is there's three relationships you need to pay attention to when this couple's in your office. Yes, of course, the relationship between the two people, but there's also each partner's relationship with him or herself that has a huge effect on the relationship between them. So being able to do, as Lori was saying, is be vulnerable. I mean, that's what all of us want in our long-term love relationships, that I can, I let you see me, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I know you'll still love me and you'll still respect me. Uh, that's what we want in our relationship so we feel safe and we can really just be ourselves and know we don't have to worry about you know will, will this person stop loving me or will the relationship end in a lot of lack of respect and you know that's that's one of the things uh, we find many people it, that stops them is they have a fear of really being open and let naked in front of the other person and let them see if they I let you see me well i don't think you'll love me anymore so i have to keep a certain distance and that relationships just can't thrive over the long term when one or both partners does that so you asked about skills so our cornerstone skill is self-intimacy and what that is, is we have something that we've developed called emotional self-awareness. And what that is, is you ask yourself three questions. We have people start out doing this three times a day. It's very simple. The emotional self-awareness exercise. Yeah, it takes less than five minutes. The question is, what am I feeling? And I joke with people and we give them a handy dandy list of feelings so people know there's positive and negative. What's causing me to feel this? Is this a, you know, is this a realistic feeling? What other feelings do I have? Because we talk to people about how often in one moment you can have contradictory feelings. You can love your kid and hate them. What can I do to take care of myself with this feeling? And we talk about honoring the feeling, respecting it, allowing yourself to sit in it. And then what can I do to take care of my relationship around this feeling? So what we say to people is the more you know yourself, this is where you learn to respond rather than react. In the moment of peak, I'm not gonna turn to my husband and say, you know, swear at him and yell at him. I'm gonna recognize I'm really angry. I'm feeling out of control. I need to calm myself down. I need to get clarity on what's underneath my anger. We talk a lot about how, for the most part, anger is a secondary emotion. 
it's a cover up for more into it's a cover up for more vulnerable feelings fear um insecurity sadness um hurt yes so i get in touch with what's really going on then i go to my partner and i say there's something i need to talk to you about when would be a good time see this is where we teach people it's not all about me in fact we have we have a handout on that that we give people but you just don't go into your partner's office and go i have to talk to you right now when would be a good time that builds resilience in me that i can know what i feel and i can wait we expect it of our children we need to expect it of ourselves and so with self intimacy i'm aware of what i feel it's part of who i am mm -hmm. and i am committed to act with integrity I will not harm myself or another with my word or my actions. So self-intimacy is the foundational skill because I can be do that. Then we go on to what we call conflict intimacy. Let me, before you go to that, Lori, let me just add one thing that you, you, you sparked, uh, Lori, and that is, you know, it's, the title of this interview is The Secrets to Long-Term Love Relationship Happiness, Michelle. And if you asked me, if I could identify one thing that's the secret, it's that being able to have emotional intimacy where we do have that safe space in our relationship to let the other person see our emotional reality you know I, I think of emotions as messages from our true self our soul our inner being whatever you want to call it about how we're doing keeping our life on a path that's healthy and righteous for us and over generalizing but generally true positive emotions steve this is something healthy this is something great this is joy appreciate this feel gratitude try and keep this in your life negative emotions is a tap on the shoulder steve there's some problem here you need to identify what it is and figure out what if anything you can do about it to take care of yourself in a healthy way and being able to have that emotional intimacy that's what we found over the years really fuels couples to be able to get past the initial honeymoon phase of the relationship to have a successful thriving relationship over the long term the fuel is really that emotional intimacy where we really let the other person see who we are because we feel safe to do that and they feel safe to do the same so you know the self intimacy is is key to that which leads to what Lori was going to talk about next which is conflict intimacy which is where 95 98% of the couples that we see this is where they get tripped up because they can't deal with their fights their differences their conflicts in a healthy way and so they just start moving far further and further away from each other well uh, to introduce conflict intimacy as a skill one of the things i say to couples is when they come to us or to me or to steve they come with an incredibly high tolerance for pain and a phenomenally low tolerance for conflict or tension and i tell them pain will kill you through disease through cancer whatever i want to reduce your tolerance for pain but i want to increase your tolerance for differences and tension because differences will not kill you in fact it creates a stronger sense of self a greater sense of the other and it goes to the question you asked about resiliency so i want to bring down the pain and increase the tension so we talk to couples about, you know, I always talk about Dolly the sheep when they cloned the sheep. Her clone didn't live as long as she did, didn't look like her. We can't, there are no two people that are the same. The point is not to be, you know, Dick and Jane like we all read in our primers and when we first started breathing. We don't want to all go up the hill and do the same thing. We are two different people. We will always be different. And the French say, viva la différence. That's where the growth comes. So it's learning to live with the difference. So we actually teach couples 
a way to talk about their differences. And it's called the initiator to inquirer. And it's a way to have them learn that one person is the initiator who talks about themselves. They're practicing in the room emotional self-awareness. And they talk about, I have this problem. When I see you do X, I take it to mean Y, and I internalize it, and I think it means you don't love me, and blah, 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 blah. The other person's job is the inquirer, and this is a huge step in emotional maturity, is to be able to open the space to let the other person do the talking. To know that I, as a listener, still exist, even though my opinion will not be represented. Does that push against emotional growth? I can let you fill up the space. And we even say to them, not only are you letting them fill up the space, this is an act of love to let someone else just fill that room. And so we teach them how to hear the other person, not to work towards resolution, because the person who's speaking, who has the problem, if they keep talking about it, they can figure out what their options are. And often, just by having that difficult conversation and being listened to by the other, they get back in touch with, not only am I angry at you, but I'm connected to you and I love you. And given the complexity of that, even though they're contradictory feelings, I can figure out a way forward. So we often talk to people about, you know, when you're very angry at your partner, the thing I want to remind you of is, this is your beloved. You can love them and be angry. How do you hold on to both, maintain your integrity, and do no harm to self or the other? And that's what we teach people, that we don't get so much out of our families. Some of us are lucky enough right. to get pieces, but not enough. Right. What do you want to say, Steve? Exactly, Laura. It's basically helping each partner learn to do two things well, Michelle. Number one, as Lori was saying, when I have a problem with my partner, when I am upset in any way how to initiate a conversation or a conflict about that in a non-attacking non-blaming way all right that i make hey this is this is about me this is my problem i'm really hot about it and i can be passionate and raise my voice but as long as i'm not attacking or blaming that it's teaching couples how to do that and then also, as Lori was referring to, and this is what most of us find most difficult, is how to listen well to our partner so that we don't take personally what he or she or they are telling us. We don't get defensive. We realize that this is about them. This is their problem. It's concerning me. It's their experience of me, and I really need to understand how they experience it. But not taking it personally and not getting defensive so we can really hear them instead of in our mind not really listening and going through all the reasons why what they're saying is absolutely untrue and let me just prove to them how wrong they are so learning how to really listen well yes and i want to take a huge step back for people who are listening the three of us have, and I will say I'm a novice compared to you two, so I'm not even going to try to pretend, but I do love couples work. I love the research. Um, you know, I, 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 like I said, I do my own independent study here. Um, but you two are the experts. And one of the things that kind of trying to tie this up in a bow for those listening, I want to say that it sounds like a lot, what we're talking about. Couples work is work. Individual work is work, right? This is, it's not easy to just come in to any setting like this and say, okay, I'm going to master everything tomorrow and this is going to be great. It takes time and it takes small steps. And I love what we're talking about because there's so much good information. This is the kind of podcast that I hope people listen to over and over again and take notes because you've got so much good stuff. And, and we'll talk a little bit about your own writings and, and your own um, book. Um, but I just want to summarize that I think it's really important for listeners who are hearing this, especially those who are coming in and recognizing some of the patterns and some of the concerns in their own relationship, that this can be healed. And small steps and these skills matter. 
and and I just think that's so important for for those out there because we're talking about so many wonderful things and it can sound I think for some overwhelming but it's really not if if we take it in small chunks absolutely and you know it's such a good point that you raised Michelle because Lori and I what we found is the vast majority of couples can heal and rebuild their relationship it's not hopeless if if they don't fall prey to the, one of those three deal breakers, if the love is still alive, even if they're not sure if they love their partner, because sometimes, Michelle, so much hurt and resentment has piled on top of the love that it's difficult to really access that feeling of loving our partner. But we find if we get those negative feelings out of the way, the love starts coming back. So if the, the love is still alive and if both you and your partner are willing to own your own part, take responsibility for your part in the problems and really work on healing your relationship and becoming a better partner, we find the, the vast majority of relationships are not unsalvageable. They can be saved and not only saved, but be stronger than they were before because they never had the skills that you're talking about, Michelle. Yes, yes. Both of you are highlighting fundamental skills. And I often tell people when it comes to therapy, so for anyone who's never been to therapy who might be listening, you know, I, I think we can consider ourselves educators who have been educated. I know myself before grad school and, and actually doing my own therapy work prior to grad school, which I, I'm so proud and happy that I did many years of my own work, I learned skills. I learned how to talk. Who knew that that was a skill? Right. Who knew communication and having respect? You know, Of course, I, I love my parents, but they didn't know that. They didn't know exactly how to teach me that. And, and we go to school for mathematics and algebra and trigonometry. Um, you know, for those who are engineers and in the hard sciences, congratulations. I still don't understand a lot of that stuff. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think what people that are listening to this can get out of our talk is that you can learn this. And the more you learn, the healthier you become, the healthier your partner and you become as a unit, the better the parenting the better the intimacy, both emotionally and physically. We haven't talked yet about the sex life piece. I do want to jump into that. But I think all of it just becomes better and that it sounds intimidating, but it's really not. Small chunks, small skills, big results. That's kind of how I look at it. Do you agree? And yes. And the other thing we talk to couples about is that being in a relationship and knowing that you're stuck and agreeing to get help is such a sign of health. It's the people who don't get the help, who hide out, who, mm -hmm. you know, are quietly suffering. And that's a shame. Yeah. And being in a relationship is a privilege. And we need to see it as a privilege. And I often tell the couples I have who have children, you know, your kids can learn math from school. Your kids can learn civic responsibility from being in society. But the one place that they are going to learn and have a front row seat to what an intimate relationship looks like is being in a family. Mm -hmm. Do not underestimate your responsibility to show them how to do this. And that's a privilege, too, to teach your children how to do it. Because loving and being loved is what makes life so valuable. Mm -hmm. And it's what heals relationships, but it can heal the world as well. So, you know, a lot of the work Steve and I do now is couples. And I decided to move in that direction because if I can heal a couple, I can help a family. And if I can help a family, I can help an extended family, which can hopefully help, you know, a neighborhood, which hopefully translates even bigger. And that's where the action is, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I couldn't agree more. This is so inspirational. I love it. And I, I, I didn't want to skim over this, this one part that I, I was thinking about as we were talking, um, because I feel like this comes up so much in couples work is a good sex life, good physical intimacy and what that means. Now there's, there's a lot of correlating, I think, research on this, 
and what's interesting to me, what I've kept reading and I keep reading and seeing is that it's not just the sex. It's actually the small things, holding hands, cuddling, being physically touching and intimate in that way that can also lead up to a good sex life. But we can't rule out the most important, which in my opinion is the emotional intimacy, which you both brought up earlier. I think this would be great for people because most of the time sex for a lot of people in their mind correlates to a healthy, successful relationship, which I don't agree with that. I think there's, as we've discussed today, it's multifactorial. But I am curious, how important is a good sex life in marital satisfaction? You want to take that, Stevie? It's important. It's an important aspect of a relationship, but it's certainly not the most important aspect of a relationship. You know, Lori was talking earlier about our concept of the three intimacies, self-intimacy. You know, if I don't know what's going on with me, I'm not going to be able to let you know what's going on with me. So it really limits my ability to be close to you and let you in and conflict intimacy, where the vast majority of, of couples run aground, and then affection intimacy. And in our work, we, we define four different ways that we can express our love and affection for our partner. Verbally, you know, whispering sweet nothings, writing love notes, stuff like that, saying loving things. Uh, what we call actions, affection, intimacy, which is going out of my way to do something purely because I believe it will make your day a little easier or it will bring a smile to your face. Going out of my way to do something just for you because I love you. Uh, by the way, that's one that many, if not most men, are most comfortable with. You know, it's not about talking and mushy stuff uh, or touchy feely stuff. It's just, hey, let me uh, let me do this home improvement project, and won't you understand that that's how I'm expressing my love for you? Uh, and then there's non-sexual physical affection, which you were just mentioning, which is so important. You know, touch. Uh, we're we're animals, and physical touch is a very powerful way to express our love and affection. And then sexual affection, which, you know, we talk about there's there's having sex and then there's making love. And making love really has the emotional component included with the physical pleasure and the physical act of sex where you really feel the closeness and the love for your partner and from your partner. Uh, and all four of those are important. And interestingly, Michelle, in, you know, we talk about what couples have taught us. We've learned that each one of us, again, more ba many times based on our family of origin history and how, how love was expressed there, each of us have a different range of which one of those types of affection we feel most comfortable giving and are most powerfully communicative of our partner's love when they give it to us. And we find many couples don't know this about either themselves or their partner, that they're confused. Like, uh, oh, you're a guy. I thought all you really wanted was to have sex. And then they find out, no, really, maybe verbal affection is most meaningful to him. Or, you know, so everyone has different ways and being able to help couples understand what am I best at, most comfortable at, in terms of which modality of love in expressing it, what am I good at, what am I weak at and what's most meaningful to my partner really helps us because, you know, when we love someone, we want them to feel our love. But and if we don't know how they most readily can receive that love, we may be communicating it in the wrong way. If I'm just doing home improvement projects and expect you to really feel loved by that. 
I may be surprised that you don't get that message. Right, right. That makes me think a little bit about Gary Chapman and love languages. Right. I think that a lot of people hear that and they, they've related, it's become kind of a, a mass um, way to understand how to communicate with your partner in their form of intimacy when it comes to emotional, physical, and, and all of the above. So yeah, that, that really resonates for me as you were saying that. And, you know, one of the things I think might be really helpful is to do a little bit of a summary, but I'm not sure how to approach that because there's just so much good information that we talked about today. Do you have any recommendations for our listeners for just to kind of summarize a little bit of our discussion today or possibly reference your writings um, and, and how they can, you know, get more out of our, our discussion. Can I go back to something for just a second before we go there? Of course. Yes, please. On sexuality. I think it's also important to educate people about sexuality. You know, there's the research by, uh, Helen Fisher, um, who looked at the functional uh, brain <clears throat> scans of people falling in love versus those who were in a long-term relationship. And, you know, she just looked at the different parts of the brain that get involved in the different hormones. So early sexual relationship is generally run by hormones, attractiveness. We're mate seeking. Um, we want to be loved. We want to be connected. Um, and it's all lovely. It's wonderful. But sexuality changes not only in the course of a relationship, but over the lifespan. And I find a lot of couples need to understand that. I mean, you know, uh, Steve and I are old enough in our 60s now that, you know, I've been through menopause and, you know, living the real life. And I talk to couples about how sexuality changes. Like a lot of couples who get older don't realize that intercourse isn't the big thing anymore when people get older. It's more about oral sex and things like that. Nobody talks about that. And people need to know you're not having inferior sex. Or when someone's pregnant and they do different things or she's not into it or she's really into it now because she's in her third trimester. People need to get educated about that so they don't think that it's supposed to always be the same. And I think that is the rut we fall into. So to me, education is so important. Absolutely, Laura. That I'm really glad you added that. And, you know, one of the main areas that couples have difficulty talking to each other about is sex yep. and so really being able to help them be vulnerable and talk to their partner you know we have a responsibility as a as a long-term love relationship partner to educate our partner about who we are what we like and what we don't like in all facets of the relationship and that includes sexually yes so really being able to talk about that and helping couples establish that because so much of us were brought up in ways where oh that's nasty or we're uncomfortable talking about oh it's so embarrassing right hey, it's just part of life yes yes we have to normalize it exactly exactly so when uh, if people are interested in in uh, learning more uh, about this stuff, of course, Lori and I did write a book a few years ago. We were asked to write a book when we gave a presentation about uh, helping couples who have experienced infidelity, and they asked us to write a book about it, uh, and it's entitled "Intimacy After Infidelity," but. Lori and I really wanted to write a book about the topic uh, that you asked us to speak about, Michelle, which is what, how come some people are so happy over the long term and so many aren't? So we cover all of these topics in that book. It's not just about infidelity. Or we also have our website, the Relationship Institute.org, the Relationship Institute.org. Wonderful. So people can go there and find you and, and some more of this information. And they can certainly call us or email us. Uh, yeah. And all of the three intimacies I, we mentioned, there's handouts in there that people are free to use. Right. There's the emotional self-awareness exercise. Everything's available oh. there. So uh, for Wonderful. free. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
Yes. And you asked for a summary. So I'll take a stab at that. We're put on this planet as a privilege. Those of us who get to live it in some form of safety are incredibly privileged. I always feel that we need to make the best of every day that we get because there's too many people in this universe who don't get all those days for a variety of reasons. And loving someone and doing it uh, in a journey with someone else is the absolute best of life. And so we all deserve to have the skills to make that relationship as rich uh, as we can and to be the best version of ourselves and to help that person who and those people who are on the journey with us to be the best version of themselves. And that takes a set of skills learning how to be present to yourself and others, learning how to accept differences, learning how to be patient through difficulties, recognizing that things aren't easy oftentimes and don't need to be because that's where the most growth comes from. And having someone you could turn to, whether it's a therapist, a rabbi, a, a priest, a friend, an elder, to talk to about your relationship too, because it shouldn't just be the province of therapists. We need to also turn to other people in our universe because a lot of people have experience to offer us as well. So one of my complaints is that too often talking about marriage is just about a professional thing when everybody, most people are married. So, and if we pick wisely, those people we confer with, we can learn a lot and it helps to support us. How about you, Stevie? What's your something? Well, well said, Lori. Well, uh, I guess for therapists that listen to this recording, uh, I would just like to encourage them to, to be, to consider working with couples. There's such a need and, but we really need to get training. I know I sure did. It's not just an extra person is in your office and besides yeah. that, just our skills as uh, as an individual therapist will transfer. To do couples justice, we really need to get good training. So that's number one. For the general population who are listening, I really want to emphasize uh, one thing you said, Michelle, which is don't give up easily on your relationship. You know, we each make a commitment when we're in a committed relationship and the relationship deserves to have us not run when the going gets tough because we made that commitment number one but number two as i said earlier most relationship problems even though they can be tragically painful uh, they most of them can be overcome when both of us will come together and work together as a couple to overcome them. Absolutely. And, and I love both of those summaries. I want to add one of my own. Um, as someone who identifies in a, as a minority female, um, you know, it's, it, it's difficult because there are so many confounding variables to therapy and getting help. Uh, for people who are suffering just from the the pandemic alone, but adding, you know, SES, your your economic financial situation perhaps is very difficult. Uh, you're you're working hard. You're trying to, you know, make ends meet. It's hard to to take care of your relationship. It's hard to take care of your emotional health and your family. Um, and for those who are in, you know, diverse backgrounds who have cultural components here and who have. Uh, various uh, backgrounds uh, that don't fit kind of the norm of what a lot of the research has been in the past, these skills still help. And this does cut across those lines. Uh, the problem is more finding the resources. So I think I just want to point out for anybody who's still looking, there are a variety of resources in the community that can offer support for couples, can offer support for families and individuals, um, and we are happy to help. We're here to help as well. Um, part of the San Diego Psychological Association's journey is to make sure that we reach out to communities and help anybody who needs that help. So you two are part of that, and we could not be more grateful for having you on the show. Is there anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I just love 
Love what you said. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 we've found that you're absolutely 100% right, Michelle. The you know, all we're divided by so many things culturally, religiously, racially, but we're all human beings and all of us want to love and be loved and we found that there clearly there's differences in approaches and knowledge you need to have in order to deal with different groups whether it's straight or gay or anglo or black or hispanic whatever but the same basic tools apply across the board so it's a it's 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 not something that you can't be able to fix because you belong to uh, you won't be able to fix because you belong to this minority group or that group and feel different yes Mm -hmm. exactly there are cultural considerations but we take those into account when you're working with someone all of these things are taken into account and this skills can be applied appropriately well thank you both so much this was such a fun talk i am so happy that we were able to do this and i appreciate your time and i'm sure everybody listening does as well I look forward to connecting with you again. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for doing a great job, Michelle. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. The information and advice offered is not intended to treat or diagnose and is not meant to replace any other professional consultation. If you'd like to know more about the San Diego Psychological Association, go to our website at sdpsych.org. That's S-D-P-S-Y-C-H dot org. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, take care of yourself and be well.